So plants and animals have their own roles and purposes. Perhaps the role of all cats is to find boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and animals have roles and purposes that may have nothing at all to do with us humans or what they're doing in our lives. You know, we so often are very grateful to animals for being guide dogs for the blind or therapy animals or horses that draw carts or other animals that help us. But that doesn't mean their only purpose on the planet is to be in service to us humans. You know, what made us so special? What made us so important? Perhaps we are here to serve them as well. Perhaps we're here to help each other. And different species have got different perspectives about what's important to them <laughs> or about who they'd like to communicate with. <laughs> we do know that cats tend to be more independent, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you might not have a kitty at home who's a very sociable herd animal who loves nothing more than to be in a big family and would love to be around other cats. We know that dogs and horses tend to like to group together and live in packs or in herds. That doesn't mean, though, that the horse or the dog in your life isn't a very independent soul who wants to live alone. We always need to remember that we're dealing with an individual, and we shouldn't be thinking about generalizations about the species or any prior knowledge. We can just simply ask the animals directly how they feel about themselves and hear straight from the horse's mouth. So another thing about animals being self-aware is that they are very able to express empathy, to feel with another being and to have compassion as well. They can know and understand what it must be like to be um, feeling pain. They feel pain when a member of their family is feeling pain somewhere else. And it's not about brain size, clearly. Modern science tends to think of brain size as meaning very intelligent. Of course it's not. <laughs> It's not at all. <laughs> Empathy can be defined as looking through each other's eyes. For us to truly know and understand another being, we need to be able to look through the eyes, their eyes and see the world from their perspective without thinking about it. And children are very, very good at this. Children have an automatic connection with animals because they are free of lots of ideas or expectations. And animals tune in very easily to kids as well. There's just natural instinctive communication. So all the adults in the audience, be wise and listen to your children and what they're saying about the animals and the plants because they're picking up messages directly. Particularly the younger the child is and the less language is interfered, the more direct knowing is available. Here are some brief examples of compassion and caring between the different species. It's well known the great relationship between elephants and their keepers. That's an orphaned elephant in Africa. These young elephants, if they're orphans, they die from heartbreak unless they have someone with them 24-7. The bottom picture is of an orca and a dog having a little greeting. And the tiger was in the Thailand Zoo. His mother rejected him when he was born, and the only other animal who had young at the time was a pig. So they put him with the pig, and he grew up with his little piglet brothers and sisters, and now they live happily together. And he doesn't think they're food. They're his brothers and sisters. <laughs> So what, would, what do we use telepathic communication for? We use it for all sorts of ways to try to understand animals better so that we can help them meet their wishes or their needs. We can use it for helping veterinarians understand their physical symptoms or describe their physical symptoms to find out what's wrong with them or what care they need. It can help with resolving behavioral issues and various distressing things. Most importantly, though, it can enhance our relationship with them. This was a cheetah I worked with in Canada who'd broken her leg and had to be confined indoors for quite a few months. And with telepathic communication, I was able to keep her calm and help her understand why she had to go through this very terrible imprisonment because it was for her own good. And from time to time, we'd let her, well, look out the window and see where she might be able to walk again one day, which she did. And these photos were taken in Mozambique by a young marine biologist who attended one of my workshops. And a few months later, while snorkeling in the warm ocean, he saw a whale shark that is the sea's biggest fish. I mean, just meters and meters and meters long. You'll see in a moment, relative to a human. And she had fishing line caught around her tail and a hook in her tail, which was obviously uh, reducing her ability to swim so well. So he remembered what he'd learned about being calm and still inside and connecting with her. He explained to her what he was going to do and that he meant well. And then he swam up to her. See how large she is. That's just her tail, and he's an adult man. 
it was potentially very dangerous. If she had just swished her tail, she, she could have knocked him unconscious. But he had explained his intention, and he got a feeling of a yes from her. And this is what he wrote about it afterwards. I told the lady, meaning the shark, exactly what I was going to do. After removing the hook, I actually swam up right next to her face and showed her the hook. She calmly gave this long, paused wink. I'll never forget her expression. So it's very helpful to calm animals down if they are in distress or if a bird has fallen out of the nest. And it's not about physical expression. It's not about facial expression. It's not about interpreting behavior because that is our minds busy trying to interpret things. <laughs> it's definitely not about body language. When us humans see an animal in a certain posture or certain body language, we tend to assume certain things. <laughs> It's really not about body language. Animals are doing what they're doing for their reasons. <laughs> How does it work? Every day we have moments of intuition. We have little gut feelings or little hints or sudden messages fall into our head and we need to learn to trust those. That's really what it's about. And it's about the energy behind the concepts, not the actual words. So sending is automatic. Animals send, we send information and it's really not about the words. <laughs> okay. Us humans tend to hang up on the idea of words, but if we're genuinely in distress and are saying help or ouch or you know, I'm really sore, I'm really unhappy, animals understand the feeling and the energy of it. It doesn't matter what we're actually saying. Luckily, they don't interpret things from a language point of view. And as they say, cats are their own particular species who may not actually talk and definitely are less likely to respond when we want them to. So we need to honor the animals and their species as well. There are simple steps, and we'll talk more about this afterwards, but the very simple steps to intentionally connecting with an animal telepathically or with a plant telepathically, they're very, very simple. So simple that we tend to think, well, they can't be real, or this is too easy, but it's really not a complicated thing. We just have to have our hearts and our minds in the right place. Usually one of the first things to do, therefore, is to relax, to consciously relax. Relaxing the body can help relax the mind, because we need to become still. When our minds are still, we can tap into our deeper knowing, which is the intuition. So being still is very much the first step. Being quiet, not with music or meditation, just being quiet, watching your breathing, and then coming down to being very calm and open, connecting with the heart. It really is about coming down into the wisdom of the heart and to imagine that you're connecting. If you would like, you could have a visualization that imagines you reaching out to connect with the animal. Better to just visualize it than to actually do it because that might disturb them physically and that might get your mind all involved in the physical interaction, which it's really not about. It's about being in a quiet space of heart connection. You could imagine reaching out to them, particularly if they're not in the same room as you because this kind of energy transmission can happen across great distances. The telepathic energy transference is not at all affected by buildings or mountains or distance. You can communicate with a dog in your room or a dog on the other side of the world. But most important is to be quiet. Here at Findhorn, you have very good access to places and practices to instill that. I noticed since my last visit, there's a nice new bright wood sign on the gate of the original garden saying, be still and know. And that is really what it's about. If you become still, you know, you know. You don't think about stuff, you just know. And in that space, you can know the moods and the thoughts and the feelings and the states of being of everything around you, from an ant to an elephant, even if they're not around you, <laughs> from a cauliflower to a tree. It's also about genuinely honoring and having reverence for that other being, not making them smaller than you or less important, but about really respecting them and who they are. And us humans tend to not like some species so much. We tend to have prejudice against things like ticks and mosquitoes. And then because we have a prejudice against ticks, we have a prejudice against the animals who carry ticks like the deer. And then we don't want them close to us because they might make us sick. And all of these stories and all of these negative thoughts, which only increase our chances of manifesting that very negative thought. If we genuinely understood that, yes, the deer are carrying the ticks and might also become sick from them, we can feel more kindly and understand we're all on the same planet in the same situation. If we understand why animals that raid our vegetable garden are hungry, perhaps, or why they're not getting enough nutrition in the very little wild areas that are left, 
we might feel more kindly to leaving some rows in our vegetable patch for them or putting some trees in a different location and saying they're welcome to eat off those. It's about living in harmony with nature and the most amazing reciprocal relationships are possible. It's also about physical considerations. We need to go quietly and perhaps somewhat camouflaged into nature. <laughs> One of my favorite animals in Africa is the meerkat. <laughs> And we can get closer to animals in nature if we are being unobtrusive in the environment, if we're not wearing big bright colors, if we're not talking loudly or thinking loudly, even if our mouths are shut. So it's about having a quiet way of walking and being. It's about being quiet within. That is truly the only requirement for this at all. And when one is quiet within, the most amazing things can happen. I was sitting on a boat in a channel on the coast of South Africa and a little, I found out afterwards, a white-throated swallow came and sat on the, on the wire, on the stay of the boat, and I wanted to respect his need for a rest, I thought, so I moved away, and he followed me, and I moved around to the other side of the boat, and he followed me, and eventually I communicated with him, and he was just curious, you know, who are you, and what do you feel like? So I offered my hand so he could feel what I felt like, and he hopped onto my hand. And we had a lovely chat about the weather, literally about the weather, <laughs> because the weather matters to a young swallow trying to fly across the channel. So amazing things can happen when you're genuinely open and peaceful. Had I been trying to have a connection with that sparrow and in, within myself reaching and grabbing for it, I bet it wouldn't have happened because I would have been wanting something of that experience. It comes down to shared awareness. Beyond words, beyond physical action and beyond behavior, it's about being in a space with an animal, with a plant, with a flower, touching or not, and about being in a state of shared awareness. It doesn't always have to be this huge conversation where there's question and answer to and fro. Just sitting quietly in the, in the presence of another is a beautiful communion, even if it's not a communication. And our dear Dorothy, <laughs> has this lovely transmission from the plant kingdom. And this is truly how I experience it as well. We quietly radiate to you, and it is as if you must stop and listen to us. You know, all of nature, all around us, is constantly radiating and being authentic and expressing who they are. All we have to do is slow down and stop long enough to be still to hear. So that's the invitation for, for all of us in our daily lives. Because we are, on a building block level, all parts of the same universe, of exactly the same kinds of parts. We're in this constant flow and motion. So why not enjoy the dance and get to know our dancing partners, every aspect of the plant, animal, mineral, elemental kingdom around us. So thank you all for being here. What we're going to do is switch right into some video footage. It's just about 12 or 13 minutes long. And this is from a case involving a black leopard in South Africa. This black leopard had been in, was born in a Belgian zoo and had never come out of his night shelter there. So the zoo got pretty upset because he wasn't being a good exhibit. He wasn't coming out of his night shelter, which is you know, a tiny, tiny little area. And so they sold him. They sold him to a breeding farm in South Africa, and then he didn't produce cubs. So then they were upset because he didn't do as they wished. So they sold him on again to a cat park that I, that I, where I came to meet him. By then he was seven years old, and when he got to the cat park for the first six months there, until the day I went to meet him, he also never came out of his night shelter, which is a small concrete enclosure about the size of a double bed. By then he was completely fed up with humans, very angry with people. And they had never intended to try to handle him or touch him directly. He's way too wild and very dangerous. But when the, when the, um, the caretaker of the place just tried to put some meat through the fence into his night shelter to, to make friends with him, this black leopard named Diablo came charging straight through two sets of electric fence that were on. Broke through the fence, um, knocked the six foot four man to the ground, bit on his arm so badly, he put him in hospital for a week. And then he went back through the hole in the fence and went back to his night shelter. So that's where the story starts. Um, they were just completely desperate to try to find out what on earth was going on with this animal and why he was so unhappy. So we're going to watch that. And after that, we'll take questions and discussion points.